Welcome to the Gaudium et Spes podcast, where every other week we bring you Catholic teachings and stories of faith from people throughout the Diocese of Pensacola, Tallahassee. This is the Gaudium et Spes podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Gaudium Ed Spes podcast. If you haven't had a chance, check out our last episode where we talked about corporal works of mercy, specifically focusing in on feeding the hungry and giving drink to the thirsty. It was a great episode by um, Bishop Bill, and um, as always, he does an incredible job with his um, education and lessons to all of us. But today we're back in the studio and we're privilege to have with us Deacon Ray, our very own Deacon Ray. Deacon Ray, welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here. Great. We've been jonesing to get you on this thing for a while now, Deacon Ray. Um, we have the privilege of working with him in the Pastoral Center. Um, he's our part, I, I don't, can we call you Emeritus Advocacy and Justice Director? Um, no. No, we can't. <laughs> no. We shall not put an emeritus on your name yet. No. Um, but of course, Ray, you're really well known to the, to the local community as a deacon at St. Anne in Gulf Breeze, yes. uh, but also your work we're going to talk about today in sheltering the homeless. So yes. thanks for coming on. My pleasure. Thank you awesome. for having me. Awesome. Sure. We start out this podcast um, always with Gaudium et Spes 1, which is just about life in general. So the joys, the hopes, griefs, and anxieties of the men of this age, especially those who are poor or in any way afflicted, these are the joys, the hopes, griefs, and anxieties of the followers of Christ. Ray, I know you work, especially as a deacon, um, brings you into close contact with joys, hopes, griefs, anxieties. Um, you're a servant above all else. So what's going on in life right now as far as all that stuff? You know, I was thinking about that question, and I, I think I'm still on a Easter high. Um, I was able to uh, serve at our vigil, um, Easter vigil, and we were able to um, bring in some new converts. And actually, we were able to baptize 10 people at the uh, Easter Vigil, and I had a, an opportunity to be a part of that. So, um, And they ranged in ages from you know adults to, I think there was, the youngest was seven years old. So um, I'm still on a high with that. Um, as far as personal highs, um, my grandchildren, of course, any grandparent will probably say that, but my grandchildren are, are, are bring, bring my wife and I a lot of joy. Uh, we're fortunate to have a grandson that lives nearby in Gulf Breeze, here in Gulf Breeze. Um, my daughter was able to bring down her two twin girls. They're oh, wow. 18 months old, mm. and they were able to come for Easter. So that made Easter a little extra special. So, um, And as far as uh, joys with regards to the ministry of Trinity House, um, just recently, I, I would say within the last couple of weeks, we've been able to place one of our senior men into uh, permanent housing, mm. into permanent housing, which is, which is the goal of Trinity House is to take these men who are homeless and to help them uh, overcome some of the habits or tendencies that might be causing their homelessness, give them a secure place to live, um, and help them along into, uh, into permanent housing when we can find it. It's getting more difficult mm. to find housing that these men can afford because these men are all senior citizens mm -hmm. and they're um, living off of just their social security. Uh, many of them don't have anything else but social security. So it's, as we all know, things are getting expensive. Uh, everything is getting more expensive and that includes rents. So um, that's our biggest challenge is to find permanent housing that these men can afford. Mm -hmm. But that was a great joy to be able to do that. Excellent. It was yeah. a great elevator pitch. I don't know if you've practiced this before, but it was like, <laughs> no, yeah, I, I, yeah, that's Trinity House right there. Yeah. yeah, don't give any more away. We're going to get to it. Okay, Suzanne, sorry, what's going on in your world? Well, I'm super excited because um, uh, tomorrow, after the airing of this show, my son graduates from college. Oh. Yeah. Gosh. So High school very, graduation very last year, college yeah. graduation this year. Exactly. Amazing. I know. Mm. So I'm thrilled for, you know, what's coming next in his life. And he's got so many great opportunities. It'll just, you know, kind of unfold the way it's meant to, I know. so. Has he, has he made the grad school or not grad school decision yet? I think grad school is definitely in his future. Okay. Um, I think, you know, workforce and grad school, kind of a combination there of mm -hmm. the two. So, nice. and... Uh, 
yeah, so it's it's really great. But um, it's going to be nice spending time with family over there and just celebrating him for the day. So really looking forward to that. Congratulations. Thanks. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, we're going to keep talking about our kids. It is uh, my son's first Holy Communion this upcoming weekend. So uh, it's our first it's our second first Holy Communion. Lucia, our oldest, had one um, a few years back. But, uh, yeah, we're just pumped. He's going to get in typical kind of familial style, but he's going to get my gold chain, my gold crucifix that I got when I was on first communion, like gold ring, because we're kind of like, they dressed me up like a little Italian-American boy, as you would anticipate. No white suit this time. My wife, my wife was like, I'm not putting my kid in a white suit. Uh, so I was a little disappointed with that. But anyhow, that all pales in comparison. The gift of the Eucharist, we've been building towards this all year. Um, he's really fallen in love with uh, reconciliation uh, since our reconciliation was received back in January. And it's been building beautifully to this moment of him uh, receiving the Lord in the Eucharist. So I'm, uh, I'm super pumped. We're all super that, pumped. Yeah. That's wonderful. Mm-hmm. What, what mass is it going to be at? What it time? is the 11 a.m. at the cathedral. Okay. So, yeah. Super. So. Him and his buddies, some of his best friends in the world, second grade class, obviously. So it's going to be an awesome day. Pictures out the wazoo. I love <laughs> it. For yeah. sure. I love it. Yep. Yeah. Well, let's get to the heart of what we're really here for, and that's a continuation of our Corporal Works of Mercy series. Um, this time, uh, we actually have somebody who is day in and day out doing Corporal Works of Mercy, specifically sheltering the homeless. So, um, Deacon Ray, but before we get into all of that, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, where did you grow up and what, what brought you here to Pensacola to begin with? So before I do that, <clears throat> thanks, Jez, for reminding me. I want to give a shout out to my grandson, Braxton. <laughs> he's eight years old and he's making his first communion as well at St. Anne's. So shout out to Braxton. Hey, yo. So um, it was um, just by accident that we ended up here, my wife and I, uh, took a vacation. We drove cross country. Uh, We grew up in Southern California. So we grew up going to Disneyland in Anaheim just about every year as kids, you know, as growing up. And uh, we never had gone to Disney World. So we decided to take a cross country trip. Mm -hmm. We drove down to Orlando, um, spent a few days at Disney World. Driving back, uh, we were coming through Pensacola and my wife, Linda, says, I know someone that lives in Pensacola. And I said, uh, you've never lived outside of the state of California. How do you know anybody in Pensacola? And anyway, um, we stopped. And it was back during the time of, no, we didn't have cell phones back then. And there were still phone booths and, and telephone books in the phone booth. So we stopped at the Denny's off of Davis Highway, uh, off the interstate there. And she looked them up in the phone book. And my son and I went into Denny's and... Um, we we're getting ready to order, and Linda says, don't order. I found them. They live in a place called Gulf Breeze. I have the directions, and um, we drove over the bridge, the three-mile bridge. It was a beautiful spring day like it is today, and uh, we just fell in love with the area, and uh, it's just quite by accident that we were able to come and um, and see this place. We fell in love with the beaches um, and just everything about about the area. Mm. Yeah. That's, wow. fascinating. So that's how we it ended is. up here. <laughs> Just, just by vacationing. Very good. And so then, um, obviously, you found employment, raised your family, and then what brought you to the pastoral center to begin with? It was soon after my ordination um, to the diaconate. Uh, bishop Parks was our bishop. He was the one who ordained me. And actually, uh, I went to, uh, to St. Anne's to serve for a Sunday Mass, and I didn't know Bishop Parks was going to be the celebrant. For some reason, Monsignor and him switched or did a, did a switch. Anyway, he was the celebrant, and I was all nervous as heck. But um, he was a great guy, and I was able to serve with Bishop at that Mass. Um, Linda invited him out to lunch, so we went to lunch. And he told me about a position that had been advertised um, at the Pastoral Center. It was a new position here at the diocese. It was a director of uh, advocacy and justice, mm-hmm. the Office of Advocacy and Justice. And um, I told him a little bit about my background, uh, my professional background, and he thought, well, maybe you should apply. Mm-hmm. So here's the man that I just was, or, you know, who just ordained me and I uh, swore obedience to. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I applied <laughs> and I got interviewed, and guess what? I got hired. So <laughs> that's how I ended up here at the Pastoral Center. I uh, was a director for a number of years, um, and then I got to the point where um, I wanted to not travel as much because the, the folks here at the Pastoral Center, 
um, you know, have the, the whole diocese to, to be, to take care of. And there's a lot of traveling. A lot of our folks do a lot of traveling. And I got to the point where I didn't want to travel as much. Um, and we were, had started the ministry of Trinity House and I just wanted to, uh, focus on that. So mm-hmm. I, I voluntarily retired, I guess, from that director position. The diocese or the pastoral center allowed me to stay on part time. He's still here, folks. and I'm still here. <laughs> I'm still here, but I'm uh, managing uh, the Trinity the Trinity Houses. We have two right now. And just real quick, Deacon Ray, your your previous career that kind of made you a, an ideal candidate is is your work in corrections. If, if I'm if I'm right. Yes, I retired from the Federal Bureau of Prisons mm-hmm. and worked in corrections for about 25 years. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. So, you know, I came in to this job in 2016. The Pastoral Center met you. You'd already been here a few years and stuff. And, um, you know, advocacy and justice is a very broad range of issues, pro-life work, prison ministry, um, being involved in the political sphere and stuff like that. But I quickly got to know that you had a heart uh, in your own personal life and then just as, as an idea in general for especially working with the homeless, working with people in insecure housing situations. Um, you work at the Washburn Center here, involving in that all the time. So is there a, a, a moment in experience, um, is it from your previous career where you saw this as like, this is a real need that I, I have a passion for? So I... I have two passions, prison ministry and, and working with the homeless. But um, having worked in the uh, Federal Bureau of Prisons, um, one of the jobs that I had for that agency is, was, was in community corrections. And what that is is, is we, uh, the Bureau would allow inmates, certain inmates that would qualify, to do the last six months or 12 months of their sentence in a halfway house okay. to help them prepare and to get ready for their eventual release because... Um, if they weren't prepared or if they weren't ready, a lot of them would become homeless, and um, and then their chances of recidivism were much much greater. So that's how I kind of marriage the the two together: prison ministry and and transitional housing. Um, I volunteered for the Alfred Washburn Center years and years ago. I started there years ago before I was even ordained a deacon. Mm-hmm. I used to uh, I used to work with a fellow by the name of um, Hal Easter. And many of you know Hal. Uh, Hal was, uh, bless his heart, he's, he's passed on, but he's married to Tina Easter, who used to work here at the mm. Pastoral Center, the, the bishop's secretary. And, and Hal and I used to, uh, I believe it was on Wednesdays, we used to run the, uh, the laundry and the showers. And that's how I got involved with um, learning about the homeless, the plight of the homeless. And uh, it's a complicated issue. Everybody has their stories and everybody has um, their own particular reasons why they're homeless. Um, but that's how I got introduced to the homeless situation. Mm. And, um, and so it's just been a part of me for, for many years. Mm. Wow. Um, so as someone who has worked in the nonprofit world myself a little bit as a board member and a volunteer and stuff, it's, it's easy to come up with the concept of what you want to do. The hard part is to, put that concept into action. And a lot of it requires a lot of financial backing and background and things like this. So can you just take us through the steps of how you went from a vision of having a place for homeless men to actually being able to open the doors of Trinity House? Well, um, I, I wouldn't be able to do it uh, number one, I want to say I wouldn't be able to do this without the support of Bishop Bill. Mm-hmm. He's been a, a very, uh, very supportive of the ministry. Um, he's got a heart for the homeless, and I, this would be, this would be, uh, this wouldn't be possible if he wasn't, if I didn't have his support. Mm-hmm. So um, it was between we were between bishops at the time. Bishop Bill still hadn't started, um, and. Catholic Charities had just vacated their offices, their old offices, and um, the old Immigration and Refugee Office is on C Street across from St. Stephen's, and it started to become a, a warehouse. Actually, I went over there. We were, I think we were putting away some excess IT equipment or computers or whatever, and we were putting inside the, you know, we were putting inside that office, and and that office was initially built as a duplex, two bedrooms and one bath on each side. But when Catholic Charities was there, um, they created office spaces.
for all the bedrooms. They took out kitchens and they created office spaces. But I thought, wow, this is a this is a this is a livable space. You know, this is a livable space. So um, once Bishop Bill got here, I, I just presented that idea. I said, Bishop, we got this. We have this home here that's only being used for storage, and we could put it to better use. And he said, yeah, that sounds right. And uh, we needed a little bit of money to put in, to do some remodeling, to put in a kitchen and repair some windows or put in some new windows. And, and the pastoral center was um, provided that. Um, and uh, we were able to start with, with our first resident. We were able to start with our first resident in January of 2020. Mm-hmm. We got our first resident. Unfortunately, that was COVID time, <laughs> right? And uh, we were dealing with um, a vulnerable population, an older population already. So for most of that first year, we only had one resident in Trinity House because we were afraid to bring in any more. We were afraid to yep. contaminate or, uh, you know, uh, contaminate the one we had. But we eventually, towards the end of the year, we got in our second resident and our third resident. And uh, mm. so that house is, is going well, going, going strong. We're full at that house. Mm. Mm. Well, first of all, I appreciate it. It's been such a cool thing here at the Pastorals. If you're not familiar with the area, this is... You kind of looked across the street, and it is kind of like it's just a house that sits there, and that just to have the vision to think people could live there instead of us. Mm-hmm. And we, uh, trust me, folks, the church will have stuff to dump in a warehouse if you provide a space. So, um, uh, it's two things. So, first and foremost is kind of oh, I think the first two corporate corporal works immersive we covered uh, are, are pretty straightforward in many ways. You know, people know how to do feeding the hungry and giving drink to the thirsty. Most of the time, you can, as we talked about in the last podcast, you can hand out a bottle of water, you can hand out a bag of lunch, you can go serve at a soup kitchen and stuff. People get to a home, clo- uh, sheltering the homeless, and everyone's like, how do I do that? You know, like, do I literally invite people mm-hmm. into my home? Do I let them stay for a week, a month, three months? What are the terms? Do I just pick them off the street? Do I have to go to the, you know, how do we do this? So, so maybe you can talk us through that process. And you knew it well, apparently, from your professional career. Is like, how do you even come upon these gentlemen and bring them into the process? So um, the population that we deal with at Trinity House are senior citizens. And, I, and the reason why we picked that population was I feel like they're the most vulnerable of our homeless population. We have a lot of senior citizens uh, homeless living in their cars mm-hmm. or living out in the woods, sleeping in a sleeping bag or in a tent. Um, it's incredible as far as how many senior citizens we have that are living in those conditions. So just the fact that, you know, as you're getting older, I'm, I'm, I'm getting older. I'm, I'll be 65 this year and, and uh, you know, starting to have, you know, my age catch up to me and, and having different, different ailments that you get in your, in your, in your senior years. Um, so it just, just the fact that they're already vulnerable just by the fact of their age. Mm -hmm. And they're also vulnerable because most of these senior citizens, if not all of them are receiving an income. Uh, A lot of them are over 62. So they're getting social security. And what happens is we have a lot of, there's a lot of predators in the homeless community that prey upon the weak and the vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And these senior citizens that are, uh, you know, they are vulnerable and they know, um, when the checks come in and, and a lot of these senior citizens are preyed upon, coerced, tricked, somehow duped out of their Social Security funds. Mm-hmm. So um, so they need to be in a safe environment, a secure environment, you know, a, 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 a stable environment. And that's what we provide at, at Trinity House for them. Mm-hmm. While we work on certain habits or tendencies um, to help them eventually be able to Live independently. Mm-hmm. Oh. And have you met? Did you, have you met most of them through the Alfred Washburn work, or so, kind of other so contexts? A, a lot from my work at the Alfred Washburn Center mm-hmm. through Saint Vincent de Paul, and then some of the uh, local parishes have have sure. referred um, have referred clients to us as well. Mm-hmm. So, and there's a process. Um, so I, I don't recommend anyone just pick up a homeless person and bring them home, okay? <laughs> okay. Um, like Chez mentioned, I do have a background um, through my professional work with the Bureau of Prisons. Um, one of the jobs I had was uh, in an office in New Orleans, a community corrections office, and my office was responsible for eight federally contracted halfway houses in the state of Louisiana. Mm. So I have a background in that. Um, there is a process to get into Trinity House. We, 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 they do an initial interview with me. 
We have a counselor that volunteers with the ministry. They do an uh, interview with the counselor. We do a health screening to make sure that, you know, they don't have any serious communicable, communicable diseases like tuberculosis or anything like that. Um, and then we do a, a, an FBI background check. But, you know, like I tell people, people shelter the homeless and, and not really even know that they're doing it. Mm. I mean, who, who has not taken in a family member that needed a place to stay for a while? Or um, maybe a friend that was in between houses. So everybody has a chance to shelter the homeless. It doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, the, the guy sitting on this curb holding a sign. Mm. And um, I heard this in a homily one time, but uh, parents shelter the homeless all the time. Because if you weren't housing your kids, they'd be out on the street, right? So we, parents have a, a, they, they do that every day. They shelter the homeless. They feed the hungry kids and they clothe the naked so um so yeah, the, the retort to that raise well you know that's it comes naturally it's these you know i mean some sometimes sometimes you sometimes, sometimes. um but uh i, I wanted I, I the second part of the question i asked earlier was that you not only have done the trinity house aspect which we're going to continue talking about but you've actually done it in your own four walls that you own that you pay a mortgage on you welcome people who were in various situations um and it wasn't like an official ministry with a you know a nonprofit set it was your home um so can you talk about it, especially between you and linda i'm sure that was a discussion that you had each time like can we do this how do we do this right yeah so of course like I couldn't do any of my ministries without the support of my wonderful wife. Mm-hmm. And, and they told us, you know, in diaconate formation, you can't be a, a good deacon. You, you can't be a deacon if you didn't have the support of your wife. So I wouldn't be able to do any of this without Linda's support. Um, I had just got hired on by the pastoral center. Um, driving to work one day, I drove by this house. I drive by North Hill, you know, and... Uh, um, I saw this house for sale, and it was one of those big old houses, you know, turn of the century houses. And uh, long story short, uh, we both, Lynn and I, both fell in love with it. It was it was a five thousand square foot house, but over the years, it got chopped up into five different apartments. Mm-hmm. And so we moved. Lynn and I moved there. <clears throat> my my mom was still alive, so we had her living in one of the apartments. Mm-hmm. And then from there, we had some extra room, and it was just a matter of um, just. We started slow, finding the right people, and you know, and and it's, they weren't all necessarily homeless people that you see on the street holding a cardboard sign. Right. You know, was, um, one or two of them were were folks that were in between houses. You know, um, they just sold their one house, their second house wasn't ready, and they needed a place to live. You know, for for a month or so, or um, Linda used to work for the Wahoos. And a lot of times, you know, the, the, the Wahoo baseball players would need a, a place to stay. They couldn't really lease a place because they, they don't know how long they're going to be in town. So um, Linda says, gosh, these guys need a place to live. And so we had the room. So we took in some baseball players. <laughs> there were a couple of men that we took in that I knew from my work in prison ministry. I knew them while they were incarcerated. and I knew what their background was. So I felt comfortable enough. I knew they didn't have any violence. Um, in their background, and so I felt comfortable enough to invite them to live with us um, while they were able to get jobs and eventually go out on their own. So wow. we did that, and it was it was very rewarding, but it was also very um, challenging mm-hmm. and sometimes stressful. Mm-hmm. So um, so you have to really be called to that. You have to really put it to prayer mm-hmm. and be called to that. And we did that for I guess about five years. Mm-hmm. And then, and then we moved on from that ministry. Mm. But I still do it through Trinity House. Mm. Wow, what a generous, generous spirit both of you guys have. So. Well, we were, we were blessed. Um, so here's my my son and daughter in law had been married for ten years and were not able to have children. When we bought this house uh, that I was talking about, this 5,000 square foot home, it needed a lot of work. And so we were able to afford it because it needed a lot of work, right? <laughs> so we got it fairly inexpensively, but um, my mother was living with us in our, in our other home. And so uh, I wasn't ready for her to move in. But Linda um, had two uh, women who were homeless that she knew from being the manager for the St. Vincent de Paul thrift store on Cervantes Street. Mm-hmm. 
and they were working at the thrift store. Mm -hmm. And so she invited one of them to live at the house with her. So from day one, mm. we, um, we, had a, we had a homeless person living in that house. And soon after that, um, we found out that our first grandchild was conceived and and uh, so it was a ble it's been a blessing and in so many ways that was a blessing um in so many other ways so um yeah it, it, I, I, we feel like i feel like i get more out of it than i put into it right blessings is just so much more for me and for the family so. nice nice so how many total men have you housed at trinity house since it opened in 2020 Ooh, okay so, um, probably close to about 20, mm. 15 to 20 men. I don't have the exact number. Okay. Um, we have currently, in, we have two houses. So, currently in the two houses, we have seven men mm -hmm. still with us. The longest we've had, uh, we have a man that's been with us now. He's, he's been with us for over three years. Mm. But he's doing very well. Um, he'd been homeless and living out in the woods for 11 years. So um, he's making progress. And what I haven't mentioned is when, when a man comes to Trinity House, um, it's just not a, it's not a shelter. It's a transitional home. And every man has, uh, we put him on a program plan. This is from my experience with the Bureau of Prisons and with, with uh, the halfway houses. We did the same thing. So we put him on a program plan, and we make sure that we stay with that man. Every month I do an, uh, we do a, a formal review of their program plan to make sure that they're progressing in their plan. Um, we put them on a contract for six months. At the end of the six months, if they're making progress on their plan, then we extend them for additional six months. Mm -hmm. If they're not making progress on their plan, we address that during those six months. And at the end of six months, if, they've, if we feel like they're not really putting in the effort, mm -hmm. then we just we dismiss them from, mm -hmm. the, from the ministry. Mm -hmm. And they know that going in, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some of the beautiful things that you've done with us as a pastoral center is you invite people into dinners with these these residents. It's right across the street um, to know them. And it leads me to the question, you know, in, in the most rudimentary fashion, you could say Jesus' command, give shelter to the homeless, the, the corporate worker mercy. was like, you could give somebody an umbrella or, you know, some kind of covering and say, I gave you shelter. But obviously everyone knows it kind of like leads to, it's a deeper meeting here. What What is having a home do for a person in every aspect of their life? How does it dignify them, set them on a pathway? So actually that reverts back to the Office of Advocacy and Justice, mm -hmm. right? We, we Catholics were very good at charity. Mm -hmm. You know, we, 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 we give out food um, at the Washburn Center. We do great at that. We, um, we write checks, you know, to, to organizations. We, um, we volunteer our time you know, either at the Alfred Washburn Center or St. Vincent de Paul or various areas. So we're very good at that. Um, so that's charitable works. But justice is about identifying a problem and then correcting it. Mm. You know, that's, it goes back to that old adage, you can give a man a fish and he eats for a day. Mm. That's charity. Mm -hmm. You teach a man how to fish and he eats for a lifetime. That's justice. So... The reason why Trinity House is not a shelter, because that's charity. You're just housing people. Um, and we don't want to just house people. We want to teach them how to fish, right? We want to teach them how to fish so they can go out and fish on their own. Mm. So we teach them how to fish. We teach them about financial responsibility. Um, a lot of the men that, that we've had at the house have never, ever had a savings account. Mm. Never, and don't know how to budget their money. Um, they get a check at the first of the month, and by the middle of the month, they're broke. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's that's the work of justice, mm -hmm. is and that's the hard part. It's getting your hands dirty. It's it's hard work, um, but and charity is good. Don't get me wrong. Charity is very good. We need charity, but justice is is corrects the problem mm -hmm. rather than just. Just helping with the problem, justice corrects the problem. So I learned that when I became the director of, of the Office of Advocacy and Justice, mm -hmm. what, what justice really means. Wow. So. Well, with these men, I know you have touched them and changed their lives, but I've got to imagine, too, that um, you have been changed by some of these men and just seeing them 
you know, go from one state of being to another state of being. And so can you share with us um, a, a story or stories of a particular man or men who have, you know, changed you in some ways in a positive light? Well, one way that this ministry has affected me is not taking anything for granted, mm. our health, our well-being, our finances. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of these men never intended to be homeless in their, in their 60s and in their 70s. Um, a couple of the men that I've worked with were veterans or are veterans, mm -hmm. um, had jobs, had careers, um, but because of certain events in their life, which could lead to abuse of alcohol or drugs, you know, um, they, 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 their lives just fell apart. So one thing that, one way it's, it's really affected me is just not take anything for granted and just be appreciative of all the gifts and the blessings that, that God has, has given to me. And then to be able to give back mm -hmm. and, and share my experiences, my knowledge, you know, however way I can. I mean, I'm no, I'm no expert at any of this, but I do it out of love. And, um, and sometimes it makes a difference and sometimes it doesn't, but you do the best you can, right? Mm -hmm. Or as you mentioned already, started out with one Trinity house, we're at two. We've also got, and you, you have a close relationship with Father Fedden, but you're not necessarily affiliated with Joseph House, but we've got, we keep expanding. Um, can you tell, tell us about the future? Um, plans i know this is not like a the last stop in, in your mind at least um and god willing for real vision yeah vision. For the, what is the vision is going forward so um so we were just able to acquire our second trinity house uh it's in east hill it's actually behind the cathedral um these these properties are owned by the diocese right so this is how we're able to acquire these houses and um and so we just started our second house and uh we're looking at possibly expanding to our third house. There's a, a house on the back side of the property where St. Joseph's is downtown, and I've okay. been talking to the pastor there mm -hmm. about, um, about possibly making that Trinity House number three. Um, the parish owns that property. Um, they've put in a lot of work into remodeling of that house, but there's still a little bit more work that needs to be done to make it a full-time livable residence, and um, I've got some contractors going in to see what that would cost and whether Trinity House could afford that. Um, so that that's a possibility of expanding to a third Trinity House. But for the last two years, um, we've been working on a tiny house community. Well, that uh, sounds fun. <laughs> tiny house community, right. Um, so across the street from the Pastoral Center on Garden Street, there's a vacant lot and um, we've been working on this for two years, but we have plans to build nine tiny homes on that piece of property. Mm. We started this over two years ago. We went through the pre-application process with the city of Pensacola, because we're on the city limits, um, and with the, all the various entities like ECUA, water management, uh, fire, Department of Transportation, and they all gave us the green light um, two years ago. Mm -hmm. So. We put out for bids, we got our bids, we got some financing. Well, not financing, we got some, some money. Mm -hmm. And uh, so now we're going through the final application process with all those entities. Um, it's a little bit harder now for some reason. Um, when we did the pre-application process, it it's went along pretty smoothly. Mm -hmm. Now it's, it's little bumps in the road that we have to make some adjustments here, adjustments there. Um, but we're hoping, we're hoping that we get all our applications approved so we can start pulling permits for site work by, by June, by summer. Wow, wow. By okay. Summer. Mm. So, um, so we get the site work done and then we can start building our tiny homes. And um, these are homes that are going to be, um, again, our vision is to keep with the senior citizen um, population. You know, a lot of our senior citizens are many of our senior citizens are on a fixed income mm -hmm. and they just can't keep up with the rising cost of rents. Mm -hmm. 
or even home ownership. A lot of them end up not being able to keep up with the taxes that keep going up every year. Just in our area alone around the diocese, there's been a gentrification of this neighborhood. Yeah. And so many people have lost their homes um, because of that. They can't keep up with the taxes. The insurance we know is going crazy and they end up losing their homes. So, um, so unlike a younger person who could go out, can go out and get a second job or, or whatever it is, um, older people have a harder, to, a harder time. So I want to keep with that segment of the population as far as our senior citizens. And um, so we're looking forward to that. It, there'll be rentals. Um, mm-hmm. So, th- so th- it won't be ownership, but it'll be rentals. But we're hoping that we can do this um, without having to go into debt. Right. And so that way we can keep the rents low. Mm-hmm. And, and, these, and, and these homes will be more permanent, not transitional, but more permanent housing. Mm-hmm. And if we're successful for that, because you know, I've heard people say, well, Ray, you're only helping, you know, you're nine tiny homes, you're only helping nine people. Well, you know, the diocese owns more land. <laughs> so if we're successful with our tiny home project of nine homes, maybe we can expand and move out and, and, and go into other areas. Wow. So. It's, I can't compliment you enough on the vision of it and how... I think all of us in Pensacola enjoy the revitalization slash gentrification of downtown. It's a nice mm-hmm. place to go. Mm-hmm. It's very beautiful. There's all sorts of new restaurants and bars. But I think it. I think this comes to fruition, and you will see kind of it will be a witness of the cost of that. I mean, like, if you want, you know, your restaurant's charging $35 entrees and stuff like that, a nice place to go out, it means people can't afford it anymore. And, like, certain only certain income levels can find their way in here. Be beautiful on Garden Street to just have kind of this well maintained, beautiful part of the community witness. And I, I, I actively pray for it and hope it, it comes to fruition Me too. very soon. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Very excited. Mm. So, um, Deacon Ray, if um, there are individuals out there or groups out there that want to get involved with Trinity House and help in some way, how do they go about doing that? Right. So, so Chaz, you mentioned uh, the community meals. Every month, we invite outside organizations um, to come, either organizations or individuals. Um, Suzanne has has done it herself. Um, we have these meals every month for the men of Trinity House. We invite the men to come. We have it here at the Pastoral Center. So if if your family or your organization, Knights of Columbus, Council of Catholic Women, whoever, or if you're just an individual that would like to sponsor a meal, um, you're, you're able to help in that way. The men love it because um, they get to meet people outside of their normal circle of, of friends, normal circle of influence. And they like to they like to talk about their progress, um, and so they, and they like to meet new people. So that's one way you can help. Um, another way you can help is um, we always take uh, cash donations. <laughs> so if you like to donate, uh, we're a five hundred one c three organization. Um, you can donate to Trinity House, and you can specify whether you want it to go to transitional housing or for the tiny house project which we uh, hope to be able to start, like I said, hopefully start pulling permits in June. Uh, if you want more information, you can go on our, uh, the diocese website. We have a link to Trinity House, or you can give me a call. I'm happy to, to answer any questions you might, anybody would have. I love talking about Trinity House. Not so much about me, <laughs> but about Trinity House. By the way, we didn't even say his last name, Deacon Ray Aguado. So if you're feverishly typing into the diocesan search page, Deacon Ray, Deacon Ray, make sure you add an Aguado in there. Um, but yeah, th- this man is is a wit- you, this man. You, Deacon Ray, are such a witness, such an asset to our diocese and your work. And um, so we'll toot your horn. You don't have to or anything like that. But yeah, yeah, we appreciate you sharing your story. All praise to the Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah. we're yeah. really grateful credit. you came on today mm-hmm. and. I know your story will touch many lives, so thank you for that. You're welcome. This is all, guys, part of the genius of this series is is to get to know the people that are doing the works of mercy in our diocese in an active way and are awesome and receive fruit from it, enjoy it, um, are, are, are improved in their own lives by it, um, and builds up the community in tremendous ways. So we're going to keep going with this series, guys, on uh, our next stop, which is with uh, visiting the imprisoned and prison ministry. In our past episodes, we have done work with Father Dustin Fedden and his work at the Joseph House. So you've gotten a little taste of prison ministry. This is going to be a broader view of just how expansive the need 
as Deacon Ray knows from his work of prison ministry in our diocese. I believe we have half of the prisons for all the entire state of Florida in our mm-hmm. diocese or something along those lines. So uh, Bishop Bill will be on here uh, to give you a rundown of what that looks like, the life of priests, the life of ministers in that role. Uh, so it'll be an unmissable episode, and we'll see you in two weeks' time. Thank you for tuning in today to the Gaudium et Spes podcast. If you would like to know more about our podcast, please visit our website, gaudiumetspes.net, or go to ptdiocese.org and click the button that says podcast. If you listen to the audio version from an app such as Apple Podcast, Spotify, or iHeartRadio, be sure to rate, review, and comment. If you watched us on YouTube, be sure to like and subscribe or leave us a comment there as well. Thank you for joining us.